Welcome back to Boring Build Friday. Today we have a new build. It's a 2019 GMC Yukon Denali. Now, it looks like a pretty easy hit, but we're about to find out if this easy hit could either be a nightmare or the easy hit it looks like. Give me a couple minutes and we'll find out. It seems our Yukon here didn't stop quite as fast as the car in front of it did. It has collision avoidance. Not sure why they turned it off because they clearly needed it. But the other car stopped, this one didn't. The rear bumper of the other car went right over the reinforcement of this. The headlights, the grill, took all the hit. Kind of folded it all right up. So we're just gonna need a bolt on front end. Pretty simple job. Now for the bad part. It doesn't start and we need to figure out why. So like most of the cars at the auction, our Yukon here was dead, which might not be a bad thing. I did pick it up in Virginia, so it had a 13 hour trip home to charge up. So we'll see if it starts, but we need to do some other stuff before we even try. First thing we need to do is get it to the storage building so that we can take it off there instead of here. So there's two common reasons why these things don't start when they get hit in the front end. And both of them have to do with the fact that the air box is off. So the first one is very simple. The mass airflow sensor here is looking for air going through it. Well, if you're trying to start it, there's air getting into the engine, it's not seeing anything. So it confuses it, it'll usually start and die. I don't know the, what problem the auction was having, why they listed it as a no start, that could have been all it is. So, in order to start it, pretty simple. Just disconnect the mass airflow sensor and it will substitute the values of the mass airflow sensor using the map sensor um, and it'll start and it'll run. So, pretty simple fix. However, this could get worse. Because that air box is broke, you have little pieces. And there's actually one right here. It's in the throttle body. Now, if they get past the throttle blade and into the engine, these little things will fall down in there and hang up a valve. When the valve hangs open, the piston comes up and they kiss. It means you probably have a bent valve or worse, a hole in a piston. So we're going to take a look inside, see if we see anything in the intake. And if I really wanted to, I could spin it over by hand. But at this point, if a valve is open and the damage is done, well, it's already done. Cranking it. Ain't gonna hurt anything. So we'll take a look and see if we see anything else that might end up in the uh, valves. And if we don't, we'll cross our fingers and turn the key. Or press the button actually on this one. So these things are kind of like a funnel for parts. It'd be nice if they used rubber, but this is hard plastic, so it breaks when it gets hit. And the throttle blade is likely open a little bit when it's running. But I looked in there with a flashlight. I don't see anything down in there. So I think we're good. I'm gonna cross our fingers and hope for the best. That's of course if my little battery charger has worked here. That's a good sign. There goes nothing. Pull our battery charger off here. Now, I did figure on having to possibly put an engine in this thing. If it wouldn't have started, wouldn't have hurt me too bad. However, since it did save me some money, means I make more. Also means this job is nice and quick. Painting gnomes will probably have more time in this than I do. So let's get it off the trailer. Before I do, I think I'm gonna use my winch to do a little framework. We'll get this radiator support out a little bit. The belt's off, maybe we can put the belt back on it then.
So I did a little studying, brushed up on my trailer unloading course, and got recertified. So let's see if I can get this right this time. So now we're on the ground, we can take a better look at it. Looks like a pretty straightforward hit, just the front end. Really no surprises, except for a windshield that's got a rock chip in it, so I'm gonna have to replace the windshield. It happens. But since I figured on possibly having to rebuild the engine or replace it, I got a little extra money to play with. So, windshield doesn't bother me at all. So a used bolt on front end would definitely be the way to go. Unfortunately, they're not easy to find and they're never cheap. It might be cheaper to put a used front end together in pieces, but we'll have to see what's out there. New parts might be the way I end up going, but like I said, we're gonna have to take this all apart, see exactly what we need, because even if we do new parts, there's a lot of little stuff that you're gonna miss. There's an electrical box in here, there's the air box, there's little brackets everywhere. All that stuff really adds up when you start buying new. So a used front end would have all that. We're gonna have a little expense with the air conditioning, because this is one, two, three, four. So I have to have a company come out and discharge it. Believe it or not, it's still full. Uh, so that cost me a little bit of money because we're saving the environment. Yeah, I don't believe it either. So whatever it hit, must have had a hitch on it. See the imprint from the hitch? That's what did all the damage back here. It just hit the reinforcement. Completely missed the frame, which is down here. Everything's right over the top. Your reinforcement just bolts on, so no frame damage at all. Just bolt on parts. Now this fender might not look too bad. It's got a little bit of a dent back here from opening the door into it. But the inside of it, where the radiator support mounts, is all pulled out and collapsed. So, even though it looks good, it's definitely gonna need one. So, like I said, the whole front end would be the way to go. Everything on the bottom of our bumper is still good with the exception of one parking sensor that had a bad day. Our radar unit's okay. I think, looks like it. Might be out of its bracket. License plate bracket, our fog lights, our bezels, the lower balance, all that stuff's still good. So, might be able to get away with just a cover. Believe it or not, the radiator is still full. Still has coolant in it. The overflow bottle's a little low because it's broken. Air box and intake tube is no good. That little bracket there. These headlights aren't cheap. Can't wait to see those. The grill's pretty expensive as well. I think that's in the back of the car. And I don't think we're putting Humpty back together. This piece bolts onto the radiator support here. It's like a headlight mounting panel. That's kind of pricey too. We got the shutters in there. So we're gonna have to look around, find a deal on some parts. Make this build worthwhile. There's our grill and our closeout panel. Pretty nice truck. You can actually call this one a truck. It's got a DVD player, sunroof. I wonder if we got any presents. And I probably didn't even have this thing long enough to find that cubby hole.
10,775 miles. All kinds of fancy buttons, heads up display, four wheel drive, pretty well loaded up. That's enough talking about this thing, it's time to get some work done. We're going to tear it all apart so we can make a list, so we know what parts to order and where to get them from. So we'll start by pulling the hood off, just as four bolts, it's pretty light, it's aluminum. Should be able to toss it nice and far. Now we can disconnect the bumper harness. Start on bolting the wheel liner, the bolts to the bumper. Do the driver's side. Couple bolts on the bottom. Our bumper is free. No pesky grill in the way. It's supposed to come off with the bumper. Somebody took it off the easy way. Now we can unbolt the headlight. There's only two bolts left. And one plug. And then bolt the bumper reinforcement. This is our bumper reinforcement removal tool. Pile. Now we can unbolt the rear fender brace. Unbolt the negative battery cable. Unbolt the front fender brace. Put the bolt back in it so we don't lose it. Pile. Pull what's left of the air box out. In the pile. We're gonna unbolt the overflow bottle. Set it off to the side. Start on a bolt in the battery tray. Disconnect the positive cable. Pull the wire off the cowl so we can set the whole fuse box back a little bit. Get the battery out of here. Slide the battery out. Now we can unbolt the rest of the battery tray. Bunch of plugs that connect to it. Unbolt it from the firewall. Unbolt the AC line and pull the tray out. In the pile. Now there's a bracket to the bottom of the air box. In the pile. We can start on bolting the front of our fender from our radiator support. We locked our running boards in the down position so we can access this bolt. And then since we had the battery out, they won't be going back up. If the running boards are up, this bolt's almost impossible to get to. So it makes our life a little easier. Now we gotta use our spoon so we can get the door past the fender. We need to open it up because there's still two bolts inside. Unbolt those two bolts. Close the door back up. There's two bolts on the top and one bolt for the spring. Guess the camera guy didn't feel like filming those. Bye. Now we're on to the driver's side, so we'll unbolt that rear brace, one bolt on the cowl, and the other one was torn out of the fender, so we don't need to unbolt that. We'll unbolt the front brace, loosen up the front of it, just turn it to the side, and put the bolt back in it just to get it out of our way. Then we can unbolt the auxiliary battery tray that nobody uses. Pull the electrical box out. Just left out the two handles, squeeze them together, and then clips itself. Now we can unbolt that plastic tray, lift it up a little bit, 
to get that battery tray out of there. Disconnect our washer hoses, pull them off the fender, unbolt our fender from our radiator support, unbolt the fender from the firewall, unbolt the fender from the cowl. Now we can unbolt our spring, put the bolt on the bottom of the fender, the two inside the door. Now we can pull the fender out. Find out that we missed a wiring harness. There are two clips that were hiding underneath that electrical box. So I pulled it out a little bit. You could see them real easy. Just popped them off. In the pile. Now since the AC guy is here, discharged our AC system. We can disconnect it since we won't be killing the environment. So we'll pull this bracket out of the way. Take out the one center bolt, then just loosen up the two and they slide up. In the pile. Now we get right to all of our AC lines. Pull them off of there. And then pull the radiator hose off. Yay, spring clamps. And we can disconnect the oil cooler lines. Pull the little clips out. Because if we get a use for an end, I know we're not getting those clips. Disconnect the radiator hose on the other side. I can disconnect the electrical harness that goes to the radiator support. Unbolt the radiator support. Lift it up, make sure we got everything. Realizing we missed a couple of bolts, a couple of ground wires that go to the frame. Lift up this side. So now we can take the whole radiator support out of there. It's not really heavy, it's just very awkward. So our truck is apart. We can start making a list of what we need out of our pile. So there's still a little more work to do. My door gaps here are absolutely horrible. The doors are bent from opening them with the fender behind them. And this side is pushed out a little bit at the top. And there's no adjustment on those hinges. Or is there? So in addition to looking bad, it operates poorly as well. It hangs pretty bad when you open it. That'll prematurely wear out the latch, and it's just harder to close the door. The driver's side is even worse. It's almost touching. Lines are all wrong, and this one really drops when you open it. So. Let's get it fixed. Doesn't require any parts. So the first thing we'll do is disconnect the wiring harness. Pull the boot off there so we can access the little plastic that retains the boot. Push the top tab down and lift it up. Then we get to the wiring harness. Just pull the little safety latch. Flip it down. That disconnects the harness. Put our boot back on. Now we can unbolt the door check. push it back into the door. We don't care if it falls in. We're going to have to pull the panels off anyway. Now we can unbolt the door from the hinges. Unlatch it. Set it down. Got some plastic on the ground so when we set it down we don't scratch the bottom of it. So there's no real adjustment on these hinges. They just need to be bent back into place. They look pretty thick but don't be deceived. They're made of a new metal called Pladonium so they bend pretty easy. A couple taps, we'll get them back into shape. We'll set the door back up. Try not to scratch it. So I don't want the painting gnomes to have to do more work. Bolt it in. 
This two bolts is enough. See how it closes? Our gaps are right. Closes nice and smooth. We're far enough in on the A pillar. So now we'll bolt it in the rest of the way. All our gaps are right on the front. And down the back. This is much easier to do without the front end on. That's why I chose to do it now. Plug our wiring harness back in. Slide the tab down on the bottom for the boot, then clip in the top. Then push it in a hundred times because I'm not really sure it's actually in there. And now onto the driver's side. I was able to push the tab in that holds the boot and lift it out of there. I didn't have to pull the boot off this time. Disconnect the little keeper for the harness, pull it back and unlatch it. Now we can unbolt our door check. Drop it into our door. Gone forever. Now we can unbolt the door. This one's going to require a little bit more work, so our gap was much worse. Probably because this door got used quite a few more times after the accident. So we'll set it down on our plastic so we don't scratch it up. On this one, the door shell itself was actually pulled out, so we're just going to hammer it back in a little bit. With this part of the shell pulled out, it pushes the top of the door back, which gives us our horrible gaps. We'll just tap it in a little bit. And since that was pulled out, our hinges matched. So we'll reshape our Play-Doh. And we'll put our door back up there. We'll latch the rear. we will go put the hinges in. I said latch the rear, buddy. Get over there. It's an expensive door to be dropping. Lift it up a little bit so we can start the bolt. And we'll run them in there. I guess I was pretty confident that this one was going to fit right, so I'll bolt in all four. And we'll check our gaps. Looks like they've improved quite a bit. Our door opens and closes like it should. That's out of the way. Now we can plug in our harness. Flip up the safety. Slide the boot down in the bottom and clip it in the top. Push it in for half an hour because I'm still not sure it's in there. Alright, I give up. So now a little framework. We're going to pop our radar unit off of here. At least the two tabs that were still held on. Just pushes in. Now we're going to straighten out our bracket a little bit. This has to be aimed properly for the adaptive cruise to work. So we'll untwist it. We'll hammer the bracket around. Get it nice and straight like it's supposed to be. This one ear needs to move a little bit. We'll just put an extension over the ear and move it around. Make sure it clips in like it's supposed to. All done. Now we'll straighten our bumper support brackets. These were welded at the end of the frame. When the reinforcement went in, pulled the outer ears out and pushed the upper ears in. Not much, but it's enough that the bumper isn't going to fit properly. We'll just tap them out a little bit. Not worth grinding them off and replacing them. Now we'll pull our radar unit back off because we don't want to break it. It's pretty expensive. Hammer our bracket into place. Now we got the bracket back where it belongs. It's safe to snap our cruise unit back into place. So we've gone as far as we can go on our Yukon for today. We'll get some parts and we'll keep going.
don't know where I'm going to get the parts just yet. We've got to find out where the best deal is. So like this video if you found it interesting. Share it if you think somebody else might. Subscribe to see the rest of this build or whatever else I'm working on. As always, thanks for watching. And I'll see you soon. So I'm sure I'm getting the question, how much should you pay for this thing? And everybody knows, I'm not here to make videos. I'm here to sell cars. I don't like giving out prices, but I will under one condition. If this video hits 1 million views before the end of this series, I'll tell you exactly how much I paid for it and how much it cost me to build it. If we only hit 500,000, I'll tell you how much it costs for me to build it. Ball's in your court, guys.